Hello, welcome to Christchurch Fairham Online. My name's Duncan, and I want to begin our service this morning by reading a verse to you from the Bible, from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 6, where it says this. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We've had some lovely weather over the past couple of days, and I believe the good weather is going to continue into this week as well. And I just want to encourage you, as the light of the sun shines on the earth and warms the earth, let us be reminded that God is the creator God. He's the one who said in the beginning, let there be light. And there was light in the darkness at the beginning of the creation story. But the creation story and the sun that shines in our sky today becomes a reminder to each and every one of us who is a believer in Jesus Christ, who is a Christian, that the light of Christ has shone into our hearts, the light of Jesus Christ that reveals the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And so as the sun warms the earth, I hope and pray the truth of Jesus' life, death and resurrection from the dead will warm your heart this morning. And as you go about your weeks and see the light shining in the sky, I pray you will be reminded of the wonderful light of the good news of Jesus Christ, which has shone in our lives, has shone in our hearts, has removed death and sin and darkness and replaced it with the light of Jesus and the life of Jesus in our hearts. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful reminder of the light of Jesus Christ? We have a great service planned this morning. Joyston's going to lead us in singing songs of praise to our God, our Father in heaven. Chris is going to lead us in prayer. And I'm going to continue our sermon series in the book of Matthew as we look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But we will, we will start with singing. And we're going to sing all about grace, the free gift of grace that God has given us in Jesus Christ. We don't earn our salvation. We don't earn our right standing before God, but rather it is freely given. The light shines in our hearts in a free, gracious, graceful way. And so each and every one of us who is a Christian has received the free gift of grace, which has earned our salvation. And that moves us to sing praise to our King, praise to our God. Let me pray and then we'll sing together. Heavenly Father, we love to gather on a Sunday morning and to hear your truth, to hear your word read. And we love to pray for one another as well. But Lord, we love to sing of your goodness and we love to sing of your grace. And so I pray, Lord, as we sing together and the words appear on the screen, Lord, may you move mightily in each of our hearts that we would sing songs that are true and sing songs that are full of the Holy Spirit. May we make melody in our hearts this morning as we celebrate your wonderful grace that you have freely given to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people.
your love and justice God You use the weak to lead the strong You lead us in the song of your salvation And all your people sing along So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God Your grace is enough and your grace is enough and your grace is enough for me and your grace is enough and your grace is enough and your grace times I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who love him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely, take, will surely overtake the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. 
no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. And God's, this psalm here is just telling us that God pays attention to those who call on him, whether God offers escape um, or whether he offers us escape from trouble in times of trouble or whether actually he, he brings us actual healing and deliverance from whatever we're struggling with. Um, so I just, I love this psalm. I love it. It speaks just that if we spend time in him, he will protect us. Um, if we read his word, he will protect us. Um, whatever we do wrong, as long as we repent and ask for forgiveness of sins and change our ways, he will protect us. He loves us no matter what. Um, so I just want to pray over us as a church and just ask God to purify our hearts and minds. Will I pray and ask God that will he pinpoint sin in our lives um, so that we can repent uh, and be and be made new and be made whole. Um, so Father God, I, I just pray, Lord Jesus, for our church. I pray for this Sunday service. I thank you, Father God, that you hear and see all things. There's nothing you don't know about us, Father God. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come boldly and confident into your presence. We are your children. And that is just amazing. And I thank you that as your children, you are our father and you love us. And yes, you discipline us from time to time. And it may be uncomfortable, but you still love us and you still bless us daily and you still fill us with the Holy Spirit daily. So I pray, pour out on our church, Father God, bring healing to those lives that need it. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll pinpoint sin in our lives, that you'll make us um, new and fresh every day. And I just pray that the word of God will explode in our hearts and minds, joint, jointly jointed together with the Holy Spirit. And I, I just pray love and, and, and the Father's presence with us. So thank you. Amen.
Thank you to Joyston and to Chris. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp to our feet. It is sweet to taste like honey. And so I pray you guide our footsteps this morning by the power of your word. And I pray as we hear the word read and hear the word preached, it would be sweet in our mouths. It would be sweet music in our ears and it would challenge us, but also encourage us and direct us to trust in Jesus Christ with all of our hearts, knowing that he is our saviour, knowing that he is the king of the kingdom of heaven, knowing that he is our brother, knowing that he has rescued us from sin and darkness into light and life. And so we praise you, Jesus Christ, and we ask that you would move mightily by the power of your Holy Spirit during this time. In Jesus' name, Amen. Wide is the gate and easy is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way that leads to life. Those who find that narrow gate and that hard way are few in number. So says Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in the passage we are about to read together. And so this sermon is all about finding the narrow gate. It's all about choosing the hard road rather than choosing the wide gate and the easy road, because the narrow gate and the hard way leads to happy, eternal life to the full. Instead of choosing an easier path that ultimately leads to destruction, only a few will hear and receive Jesus' words in this sermon. Many will ignore these words and perish as a consequence. And so I hope and pray this morning that we would be those who heed Jesus' words, who go through the narrow gate and who follow the hard way that ultimately leads to happy and eternal life. Let me read to you from Matthew 7, verses 1 to 14. Matthew 7, verses 1 to 14. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven Give good gifts to those who ask him. So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. In those 14 verses, 
Jesus gives us three instructions and he backs up his instructions with three simple but powerful illustrations. So firstly, Jesus instructs us not to judge others in verses one to six, and he uses an illustration of specks and logs in our eyes. Secondly, Jesus instructs us to ask, seek and knock in verses seven to 11. And he uses an illustration of a father giving good gifts to his son. And thirdly, Jesus instructs us to treat others as we would like to be treated in verses 12 to 14. And he uses an illustration of a narrow gate and a an hard path compared with a wide gate and an easy way. And so those are our three points in this sermon this morning. So let's start by looking at verses one to six, where Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. Do not judge others, says Jesus Christ, because with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measuring stick that you use to judge other people, God will use that same measuring stick, that same measure to condemn you. Now, Jesus, when he says that, he knows that there are people who's, who need to judge because of their office or profession. He knows that there are legal judges who need to apply the law and decide and judge whether a criminal is guilty or innocent. He knows that there are employers who need to judge their employees. Employers need to decide, firstly, whether they're going to hire someone. Secondly, whether they're going to promote that person and give them a pay rise. And thirdly, whether they need to make their employee redundant. Employers need to make judgments about people. Church leaders need to make judgments about whether other teachers are true or false teachers. He, a church leader needs to make judgments about who are the sheep in his fold and who might be a wolf and dangerous to the fold. So there's all sorts of people who need to make judgments in life. And Jesus isn't talking about those kinds of judgments in this passage in the first six verses of Matthew chapter seven. Rather, Jesus is talking about the kind of judgment where you puff yourself up at the expense of others. He's talking about the kind of self-righteous superiority that we sometimes know in our hearts in order to criticise, undermine or think negatively about other people. He's talking about those moments in, in your life and my life where we exaggerate our own goodness, our own righteousness, and we exaggerate someone else's badness in a judgmental way. And Jesus says, don't judge like that. Don't be self-righteous. Don't be proud. Don't look down on others. Don't exaggerate their sinfulness while neglecting to realise your own sinfulness. And to illustrate this instruction, to illustrate this way of kingdom living, this way that all Christians should be, we should not be judgmental. To illustrate this, Jesus tells a humorous little story with a person who has a great big log in their own eye and they're trying to remove a tiny little speck from someone else's eye. And although it's quite a humorous image, if you picture the image of, can you imagine you went to an eye doctor and he came in with a great big log in his eye and he said, I'll just take that speck out. You would say, no, thanks. I'll have another doctor, please. But although it's a humorous little story, it is really a powerful illustration at revealing the sinfulness of the human soul. And as we meditate on this illustration that Jesus Christ uses, four truths emerge. You know, when we read scripture, we're not just called to read it, we're called to meditate on it and think upon it, chew upon it, and some start to understand the meaning behind the text. And I hope you do that when you read the Bible in your own private time. But as we meditate on this text, on this illustration, four truths emerge. The first truth that emerges is that all of us are blind to just how sinful and flawed 
we truly are. Did you see at the end of verse 3 that the person in this story doesn't even notice that he's got a log in his own eye. He sees the speck in his brother's eye, but he, he doesn't notice the log in his own eye. In the same way, all of us, every human in history, apart from Jesus, has been and is more sinful than we realise. Even if you're a very critical and self-aware person, let me tell you something, you are more sinful than you realise. We are blind to the things that we do wrong. We are deceived into thinking that we are good people and we do far much more wrong than we truly realise. I'll tell you something that's true. You will have said things and done things that have hurt others and you didn't even realise you were hurting them when you said it. You didn't you won't even realise that you've done something wrong and you will have you've caused damage. You have done something negative to someone else in this world. That's quite a humbling thought, isn't it? There's sin that you have committed that you haven't realised that you've committed. There's evil that you've done and you don't you don't even have a perception of the wrong that you've done in certain situations. We are blind, we are deceived as to just how sinful we truly are. We we haven't noticed the great big log in our own eyes. And even if you do have a perception of your own sin in your life and the things you do wrong, that log is bigger than you realise. Your sin is greater than even you perceive. And so instead of focusing on taking specks out of other people's eyes, each of us truly needs someone to save us. We're walking around through life and, and we, we have sin in our lives that's even greater and even bigger and even more significant that we have noticed. We have logs in our eyes that we haven't noticed. We need someone to come and to show us our sin and show us our wrongdoing and remove those logs from our eyes. We need a saviour. And so that's the first truth that emerges from this story. We're blind to just how sinful and just how flawed we really are. The the second truth that emerges, and I know this is true of me, we focus too much on other people's flaws and wrongdoing. In fact, we can be transfixed by the speck in someone else's eye in a truly negative way. Do you see that in the story? This guy's got a great big log in his eye, but he's seen the speck, he's seen the flaw in someone else and he becomes focused on it. It it grabs his attention, it starts to enlarge in his mind, so it's no longer just a speck, but it's something really important that he needs to reach out and grab and take out of the person's eye. We focus, we become transfixed by wrongdoing and and sin in other people's lives. Perhaps those sins have caused us hurt and done us wrong, but we focus on those sins at the expense of noticing the things that we have done wrong. You know, I have a wonderful, happy marriage. I have a wonderful wife in Rachel and I love her to bits. But on occasion, Rachel and I will have arguments. I'm sorry to say that. I wish that weren't true, but we do we do from time to time argue. And I've come to realise that all our arguments ultimately come down to the sin that Jesus is describing in these verses in Matthew 7 verses 1 to 5. You, you see, I will spot a speck in Rachel's eye some flaw, some tiny little flaw in her character or her behaviour and I will become transfixed upon that speck. And as I as I focus on that flaw in her character, I will completely fail to notice the sin in my own life. And in fact, that speck in my mind will 
become much bigger than it actually is. I'll enlarge it in my head. I think it's a bigger sin than it really is. And, and it will irritate me in my heart. That tiny little speck will become an irritation first. And then it will boil up into anger as in my mind, this speck grows and grows and grows until eventually I'll burst out and say something to Rachel, not in love for my wife, but in, in anger. And then she'll she'll respond and she'll say something about the massive log in my eye. So I said something about the speck in her eye and she said something about the log in my eye. And that's where our arguments come from. It, it comes from a wrongful focus on someone else's sin and imperfection at the expense of seeing our own sin and the log in our own eye. You know, praise God, me and Rachel are good at making up after arguments and we're doing well. We have a happy marriage, but we do argue. And it's because of this this dynamic, this sinfulness within us where we see the flaws in someone else and we don't notice the sin, the logs in our own eyes. We're blind to our own flaws, but we focus and enlarge the sin in other people's lives. Do you know that in your own life? This is what Jesus is talking about. That's the second truth that emerges, that we focus too much on other people's flaws and it causes hurt and pain and argument and conflict within relationships. The third truth that emerges from this little illustration is that we have a saviour complex. Have a look at verse four, where the man with a log in his eye says, let me take the speck out of your eye. He's completely unqualified and unfit to take the speck out of someone someone else's eye because he's got a log in his eye. And yet we do the exact same thing. We think we can save. We think we can change others in our own strength and in our own righteousness. We think we are the saviors of the world and we can remove all the wrongdoing. We can remove the specks out of other people's eyes. And so that's what we try to do. We try to change people. We try to, to reach out and, and point out their flaws. And, and we think in some self-righteous kind of way that we're doing what's right by pointing at someone and going, oh, you're doing this really badly wrong and it's awful and let me help you and we're not we're just we're, we're, we're choosing to think of ourselves as their saviour we have a saviour complex let me take the speck out of your eye even when we're unfit and unqualified to save anybody and so the fourth truth that emerges is this what we really need is someone without any specks or any logs in their eyes to come and help us. If I've got a log in my eye, I can't help someone with a speck in their eye, even if I sinfully think, have this savior complex and think I can help. In reality, I can't help. And actually, even a tiny speck means the person with a speck in their eye can't really help me with my log because they can't see properly either. A tiny speck in the eye makes a huge difference to your vision. What we really need is someone without any specks or any logs in their eyes, someone whose vision is perfect, someone whose righteousness is perfect. And there's only one. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who was ever fully righteous from birth to death. And even after he rose from the dead, he was also perfect in all that he did. Jesus, the fully righteous one, the one without any specks in his eyes. No reason to complain at him. No reason to accuse him of sin, for he was blameless in all ways. He truly is the great eye doctor. He truly is the one who can come and remove the biggest logs and the smallest specks from our eyes. We who have sin in our lives need someone righteous to rescue us. And that person is Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Jesus Christ this morning. Believe in his life here on earth. Believe in his death on the cross for the sins of the world. Believe in his resurrection from the dead. He defeated death. Death could not hold it. Believe in his ascension to heaven. Believe that he is the king of the kingdom of heaven. Put your faith in him this morning and he will bring you. He will gift you by grace forgiveness. He will remove the specks and the logs from your eyes and he will take away by the Spirit's power your flaws in order that you might see clearly. Jesus is the great eye doctor. He is the great saviour in whom we must trust for salvation. And once you've been forgiven by Jesus Christ, once a log has been removed from your eye, 
The conversation goes very differently with someone who's got a speck in their eye. The conversation isn't, I've seen you've got a flaw in your life and I don't and I can help you and let me remove the speck out of your eye. That's not someone who's been truly forgiven by Jesus Christ. That's not how the conversation goes. No, the conversation goes more like this. I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. In fact, you know what? I had a massive great log in my eye. I didn't even notice. I didn't even realise. And I've noticed that you've got a tiny speck in your eye that you've done things wrong too. And you know what, I am i can't really help you, but I know someone who can. Let me introduce you to the greatest eye doctor in all of history. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. He can help you with that sin. He can help you with your guilt. He can bring you forgiveness. He can grant you eternal life. You've got to come meet Jesus. You see, that is a humble conversation rather than a judgmental conversation. And this is how we're called to evangelise and share the gospel, in a humble way. I can't help you. I'm not your saviour, but Jesus can help you, and he is the saviour of the world. Let me make one final point under this opening header of do not judge by looking at verse 6. Now, in verse 6, Jesus just adds a little bit of balance to what he said. He, he says, you shouldn't judge, you shouldn't self-righteously puff yourself up and condemn and criticise and judge others. But there is a place for wise discernment. That's what he's, he's saying in verse 6. We don't want to self-righteously condemn others, but there is a place for wise discernment. And we need to be wise about the way we share the holy things of the good news of Christianity. We need to be wise about what we do with the pearls of the Bible and the pearls of Jesus that we know and love as Christians. And so there's a general rule, which is we share those things generously and liberally with others. We want to declare the good news of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible. And so we should often be talking about Jesus, often sharing these pearls and sharing these holy things with others. But from time to time, we will come across dogs, people who become aggressive when they hear these truths and seek to attack us. And sometimes we'll come across Pigs who, who can't tell the difference between the pearls and the mud and they trample the pearls and the mud underfoot. And so from time to time we will come across people who react very strongly and very negatively to the holy things of the Bible. And in those moments we need to use our judgment and use our wise discernment and just hold back and say actually for that person I'm going to pray. I'm not going to push and shove the gospel towards them because they're going to react angrily, angrily and attack me or they're going to be like they're going to trample the pearls that I give them in all the mud of the of the false lies of this world and maybe you've been sharing the gospel with the same person for years and years and years and maybe that's how they, they get aggressive when you share the gospel or, or they just trample on it immediately and actually maybe it's wise in those moments to just draw back and just say I'm going to commit to prayer for that person rather than pushing forward these holy things and these pearls. And I think that that's what Jesus is saying. We shouldn't be judging people. We shouldn't be withholding the gospel but we think, because we think they can't possibly repent. But sometimes we need to show wise discernment with the people we speak with. That's what verse 6 is all about. A metaphorical way of saying there is a place for wise discernment even as we don't judge others in a condemnatory way in a puffed up self-righteous way. Secondly then, let's talk about verses 7 to 11, where Jesus says, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The Christian life, the kingdom life, the disciple of Jesus life is a life of asking and seeking and knocking. And Jesus uses another illustration here, another powerful but simple illustration of a son asking his father for a good thing. He's asking for bread and fish. And Jesus says, well, the, the father's going to give him bread. The father's going to give him fish. The father's not going to give him a stone. The father's not going to give him a serpent. 
and I can see three truths emerging from this illustration. The first is that Jesus calls earthly fathers evil. Verse 11, Jesus says, if you who are evil give good gifts, how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts? You see, the first illustration taught us that we have great big logs in our eyes, that we have done things wrong, that we are sinful even more than we realise. Well, here again, Jesus brings a similar um, a similar teaching in this illustration because this illustration teaches us that we are evil. We fall short of God's standard of goodness. And so Jesus says you can only truly call God good. He is, he is the only one who is truly good. We are evil. We do things wrong. We think selfishly and sinfully and proudly. We think judgmentally. We often don't give good gifts to others like our Father in heaven gives good gifts. And yet the point of this illustration is that even though fathers are evil, they know how to give good gifts to their sons. How much more does our heavenly father know how to give good gifts? And so that's the second truth that emerges. While earthly fathers are evil, our heavenly father is supremely good. Perfectly good. This illustration is all about the character of God. He's our father and he's good. He's so good. Chris read that psalm earlier, didn't he, in the service? Taste and see that the Lord is good. If you don't know the goodness of God, I want you to know he is good. He is so good. He's loving and kind and compassionate. He's infinitely wise. He's infinitely powerful. And he always knows what's best for me. And he's so, so good. He's brought me from a, a place of pure sinfulness and arrogance and depravity and he's brought me into the light of Christ and he has loved me and poured out his love upon me day by day his mercies are new every morning God has provided for me richly in many different ways and I love him because God is good you know when you th you thought about the log illustration you thought the log illustration was about judgment but in a sense, the log and speck illustration was actually about the righteousness of Christ. It was about realising that we all have logs in our eyes and only Jesus can see clearly. And in the same way, you thought this illustration was about asking and seeking and knocking, but actually it's about the goodness of God the Father. I, lo I love the teaching of Jesus. He's not just laying out instructions here. He's teaching us about his righteousness and about the character of God in heaven. And what we learn here is he is good. And so the third truth that emerges is that we can be confident that when we ask God for good gifts, he will give them to us. He is infinitely wise. He is infinitely powerful. And he is good. And so if when we pray, we don't receive answers to our prayers or, or the answer is no. We know that God has something better for us because he certainly has the power to answer our prayers and he ha certainly has the goodness to give us good gifts. So if we ask for something, we don't get it. Then we must know that what God has for us is even better than what we were asking for. But when we ask for good things. God will give. If evil fathers on earth know how to give good gifts, how much more does our good, perfect heavenly father know how to give us good gifts? And so this should release us. This should give us a freedom and a joy and a passion for asking God, seeking God and knocking on God's door over and over. Because we know that when we ask and we ask for something that's good, God's going to give it to us. So let me ask you this morning, are you doing that? Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? What have you asked for in the last week? What have you asked God for in your prayer life in the last week? You know, there are some things that God wants to give to us, but he's waiting for us to ask. And the reason that he waits is because if he just gives it to us, 
we wouldn't realize that that was a gift from God. We might even become conceited and think that we had earned the gift that we had received. We wouldn't recognize God. But when we pray and ask and then God gives, then we realize that it's an answer to prayer and we give God the praise and the glory. And we don't think that we've earned that gift by ourselves, but rather we know that it's come from God. And so there are some things that God wants to give to you and he's waiting for you to ask him so that we would give him the praise as the source of the gift. So if you're not a Christian, I would encourage you, ask for revelation from God. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Ask for an understanding of the good news of Christianity. Ask for a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ask for the Holy Spirit, which is the, the gift that God gives to all who believe in him that fills our lives, God with, within us. Ask for those things. If you're not a Christian this morning, God will hear you. God will answer you. God is a good father. He knows the things you need and he will answer your prayers in amazing, amazing ways. If you are a Christian, also ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, in Luke's gospel, Jesus uses the very same illustration and teaching to say that we must ask for the good gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you asked for the Holy Spirit this week? Have you asked for the Holy Spirit today that the Holy Spirit, he would come and fill you and enrich your lives, that he would help you and guide you and empower you to live the Christian life? Ask for the good gift of the Holy Spirit. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for greater joy. Ask for greater boldness. Ask for greater patience ask for words and not of knowledge and words of prophecy to bless the church we must be asking people we know we need god's help and so let us ask him over and over ask him for these gifts knowing that when we ask for something good god says yes i'm giving that i'm a good father i will give and when we ask for something that's not good god in his wisdom and goodness withholds those things from us when we ask god we affirm that we believe in his goodness. What about seeking? Have you been seeking this week? Not just asking and receiving immediately, but sometimes we need to pray and spend time in prayer. And sometimes we need to open our Bibles and seek truth and, and seek wisdom and seek God himself. Uh, maybe you're good at asking, but maybe you're not good at seeking and dwelling and staying in the place, really seeking God's presence. You know, last week, Jason asked us this question. What is our greatest treasure? Is it wealth on earth or is it God himself? And so we need to seek God himself. You know, prayer isn't just rattling off a list of requests and asking. It's also seeking God, entering into his presence. Lord, meet with me today. Meet with me in this moment. I long to to experience your presence in a greater way than before. Lord, I'm seeking you in the word. I long to understand who you are better. Are you seeking God? Are you seeking the kingdom? Are you seeking wisdom? We have to make decisions and choices all the time in this life. Are you spending time asking God for wisdom and then seeking his wisdom? Are you asking? Are you seeking? What about knocking? Jesus tells a parable in Luke 18 about the persistent widow and the persistent widow has an, an unjust judge, a judge who doesn't want to bring justice. And yet this widow knocks on the judge's door night and day, persistently saying, judge, give me justice. And although this judge is wicked and evil, eventually he gives in because this widow will not stop asking. And the moral of that parable is that we need to be persistent prayers, persistent askers, persistently knocking on God's door saying, Lord, answer my prayers. There's this thing that I've prayed about and you haven't yet said yes to it, but I know it's a good thing. And so I'm reaching out for you. I've prayed for the salvation of my friend over and over again. And yet, Lord, I'm still knocking on your door. Remember Jacob in Genesis 32, um, who wrestles with God all, all of the night through in order to receive a blessing from God. In the same way, we need to wrestle with God in prayer sometimes. We need to knock on his door. Don't just pray once about things. Pray again and again and again. If there's something that really, really matters to you, like the salvation of a friend, like the salvation of a family member, like a gift that you'd really like, pray day and day and night. If someone's brought a prophetic word over you about something you're going to do in your life and it hasn't yet happened and you really believe it was a true prophetic word, then keep praying into that. Keep praying for it. Don't, don't give up. We need to ask. We need to seek. And we need to knock in our prayer lives. 
I wonder whether that is true of you. Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? If not, do you truly believe that God is good? Do you believe that he cares for you? Do you believe that he hears your prayer? Because he does. He is good. He does care for you. He does hear. He is good. And he will give good gifts to those who ask, seek and knock. Finally and thirdly, in verses 12 to 14, Jesus gives us what's come to be known as the golden rule. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. It's a very simple instruction to understand, but a very difficult one to live out. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do to others. First thing that's interesting to me in verse 12 is the word so. Verse 12 flows from verse 11. It's the goodness of our Father in giving us good gifts that must inspire us and flow through us to bless and treat others as we would like to be treated. Do you see there's an order there? It's God's goodness to us and therefore our goodness to others. Other religions teach it's our goodness to others and therefore on the basis of our goodness to others God is good to us but Christianity says no God is good to you. God gives good gifts to you and therefore because of God's goodness to you you should be good to others. The order is different in Christianity. That's an important distinction. The other thing that's interesting to me about verse 12 is that verse 12 is positive. Now my instinct is that most people Christian or not do an okay job of living out the negative version of verse 12. Don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. I think in general people are quite good at living out that negative version of the command. Not Certainly not perfect. No one's perfect in not doing to others what they wouldn't want to do that would that they wouldn't want someone else to do to them. But they do an okay job of living out the negative version But Jesus states this positively, do to others what you would have them do to you. And I think that calls for a higher level of love and service to others than the negative way of stating this command. We need to be actively thinking about what others desire and want in life and how can how can we treat others as we would like to be treated it's a more active stance i think negative the negative way of saying it makes you quite passive whereas the positive way of stating it seems we need to be active in serving and loving and caring for others going out of our way to serve others and so maybe that's what you need to challenge yourself with this morning when was the last time you had this kind of thought pattern how would i like to be treated if i were in their situation And okay, if that's the case, am I going to go out of my way in order to treat them like that at this time? How often are you thinking about others' wants and desires and seeking to serve and meet them and help them? How often are actually you just thinking about yourself rather than wanting to really treat others as you like to be treated? And so Jesus uses a third illustration in verses 13 and 14. The wide gate and the easy path, which is representative of a life of ignoring Jesus's teaching, a life of only living out the bits of Jesus's teaching that you quite like. But this wide gate and this wide, easy road leads to destruction. And in comparison, there's a narrow gate and a hard path that's representative of the life of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And there's blissful happiness. There's eternal happiness to be found through the narrow gate and on the hard way. But do not think for a second that walking that way is easy. Yes, there's blissful happiness in the presence of God, a relationship with God the Father in secret, so many wonderful rewards and blessings in eternity on the hard way, but it's hard. It's a narrow gate that you have to find and it's a hard road to walk. Being a Christian is not easy. It's hard. So I want to bring a few reflections on this illustration too. The first reflection is a haunting one, a sorrowful one. 
but an important one. The majority of people will not be saved. Most choose the wide gate and the easy path. Many choose the path and choose the road that leads to destruction. And so my, I urge you, I urge you today, do not be like the majority of people. Do not be like the many, for they will receive destruction, but rather be like the few who find the, the narrow gate and the hard path of discipleship and following and believing in Jesus Christ. And my second reflection is this, that this saying of Jesus is completely transformed when Jesus calls himself in John's gospel, in John 14, Jesus calls himself the way, the truth and the life. And so the narrow way that Jesus is talking about is himself. If we are to enter by the narrow gate and walk this hard way, we need to put our faith in Christ. We need to believe the truth of Christ and we will receive eternal life. Jesus himself is the way to life. He is the way, the truth and the life. And in fact, there is no other way to eternal life. If you do not believe in Jesus, you will not receive eternal life. There's no other way to eternal life. It only comes by Jesus. He's the only way to God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth and the, the life. And if we want to enter the narrow gate and walk on the hard path, we need to trust in Jesus Christ and believe in him. And we will receive this wonderful grace gift of eternal life, salvation, the blissful happiness of the Beatitudes and the kingdom of heaven comes only through Jesus Christ, for he is the way. And so we say together this morning, we do not want to judge others. We do not want to self-righteously puff ourselves up and condemn and criticise and speak negatively about others. No, we want to show love and mercy to others and welcome people to visit and see the great eye doctor Jesus Christ in a humble way. We say this morning that we we do we want to um, treat others as we lo- want to be treated. And we say we want to be askers and seekers and those who knock on God's door. We want to respond to the challenges here that Jesus gives us. But most of all, we want Jesus. We want to believe on him and we want to walk his way. Though it may be hard, we know it's the way that leads to life. And so with all that we are, we run to Jesus and we receive him and we believe in him and we walk in his footsteps. He is our Lord. He is our saviour. He is our king. And we love him. Of all these challenges, we want to take on the challenges. We want to live out these challenges. But most of all, we want to receive and believe in Jesus Christ, for he is the way to life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the way, the truth and the life. There is no other way to be saved other than believing in you, Jesus. And so we thank you for your life and your death on the cross for our sins. We thank you for for your resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday. We thank you for your leadership. We thank you that you have rescued us. And Lord, we choose to follow you. We choose to walk the hard path. We choose to go through the narrow gate. We will not follow the many, but we will be part of the few who trust and believe in you, Jesus Christ, for salvation. We ask that you would remove judgmental attitudes in our hearts, that we would be merciful, loving and humble towards others. We pray that you would give us a spirit of asking, of seeking and of knocking, that we would be very prayerful people, relying on your goodness as we seek you in prayer. And we ask that we would treat others the right way. We would treat others as we ourselves want to be treated. And we would do this positively and actively in love and service, Lord God. But Lord, we pray you would keep us on the narrow path. You would keep us on the narrow way. You would keep us through the narrow gate that leads to life. For we do not want to be destroyed. Lord, if there are any unbelievers watching, may they know that they are on the path to destruction. And may you reveal to them Jesus Christ, the narrow gate and the hard path that they might turn and believe on Christ today and receive salvation, receive the blissful happiness of the kingdom of heaven, receive the eternal life that we have been rewarded with through Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for all your blessings. 
blessings to us. We love you, Lord, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we process and respond to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, to not judge, to ask, seek and knock, to treat others as we ourselves would like to be treated, to follow Christ the hard way and the narrow gate, we're going to sing a song of worship and a song of response. We're going to sing a song that's about salvation and a song that's about surrender. We're going to sing together, This is our God. All the words will appear on the screen. Let's sing together. Your grace is enough, more than I need. At your word, I will be. Your spirit make me new, and I will fall at your feet. I will fall at your feet, and I will worship you here. I will fall.
Great is your love, poured out for all. This is our God, lifted on high from death to life. Forever our God is glorified, servant and king, rescue the world. This is our God. Thank you so much for watching our service this morning. I really hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, do feel free to get in touch with us by emailing us at contact at We would love to hear from you. And if you're a member of the church, then I look forward to seeing you on Zoom in a moment, 11.15. Uh, um, our Zoom prayer meeting where we pray together. It will be a wonderful time. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you and goodbye. Have great weeks, everybody.